Welcome everyone back from the coffee break. And uh, moving straight on, our next uh, speaker is Voice of Dukic, uh, who is a senior member of the technical staff at Oracle. Furthermore, he holds a PhD in computer science from ETH uh, Zurich. He designs and uh, builds uh, systems with strong theoretical foundations and is focused on improving cloud infrastructure. Uh, he will be giving a talk about the happiness index uh, in the cloud. So without further ado, I'll give you voice up. Hello everyone, hello again. I hope you can hear me well. Everything um, is good. Everything is good. Thanks a lot. So, um, so yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm Voice of Jukic. Um, for the local audience, I, I graduated from Futuna in Arisa, then moved to, to Zurich, where I did my PhD in computer science, where I was focused on uh, computer systems and distributed systems in general, with focus on cloud. And today I'll be talking about happiness index in the cloud, what makes us happy and unhappy, both us as users, but also cloud providers, what are their goals? Uh, are we happy today in the cloud and can we, can we improve the, the happiness as it is um, today? And this talk is based on, a, on a research uh, I've recently done and you can find a paper uh, on that uh, on my website, voiceofdukit.ch. Uh, this is a mostly research talk and it requires some background knowledge on cloud computing, how cloud operates and how we use cloud today. But I'll, pro I'll try to provide sufficient background so, so everyone can, can follow. So, so far I believe everyone is, uh, is familiar with the cloud to some extent and we all try to use it uh, and have some experience and opinion on it. So we as tenants or cloud users always want to have uh, sufficient amount of resources to support our workloads, whatever it is, like web servers, databases, machine learning. We always want to, to have enough, uh, however we define that, uh, but also we don't want to pay too much. We don't want to overbook resources and then buy huge machines and then don't, don't use them, just pay for them. So this is what we really want to avoid because the cost may be significant if we uh, incorrectly provision our workload. On the other hand, cloud providers have also incentive to give us what we want and be competitive, make us happy because that will in the long run uh, enable them to keep the customers and survive in this competitive cloud environment. Also from their side, what, what they're interested in, like providers as, as AWS or, uh, or Azure, uh, they want to have low, uh, they want to achieve high resource utilization. This is a mistake here, not low resource utilization, uh, because the more resources they utilize, the more money they make. If they don't utilize the infrastructure correctly, uh, they're just paying for the infrastructure without monetizing it by selling it to the customers. Now let's see how we, how we use cloud today. So let's say we, we write a piece of code that does whatever, uh, and we choose the, the provider. Whatever we choose, uh, we have this step in which we have to pick the amount of resources, number of machines we want to use. So maybe for some workloads, one machine is enough. Is enough. But for, for some other workloads, we have to go distributed and we have to use multiple machines to, to achieve our goal. So the way we make this decision is in, in some kind of loop. So first we pick a configuration um, in whatever way, so we just have some, some background knowledge and, and intuition about it. So we pick three machines and then we deploy our workload. Uh, we measure CPU utilization, response latency, or whatever we care about. We evaluate the result, and based on that, we potentially pick another configuration, and then we, we are in this loop for, for quite some time. This is quite some effort from the user side until we find a configuration that suits our workload. So this this loop has a bunch of problems because it, it's a lot of work and it's potentially expensive if you don't know what you're doing. On the other hand, uh, cloud providers don't, don't make our life easy here because they offer quite a lot of options for us to, to choose from. So, for example, AWS offers a bunch of general purpose machines, compute optimized machines, memory optimized machines, storage optimized machines, and on top of that, we have hardware acceleration, 
we have cloud managed services like databases, DNS, things like that. Um, and on top of that, we have to we have to worry about storage. So quite a lot of options, and it's really difficult to navigate this cloud space. And from what it seems to be a trend in cloud computing, cloud providers keep adding those services to help with particular workloads. But for beginners or like people who don't really understand the space, it's very difficult to navigate through it. And you can potentially pay quite a lot of money because you're using uh, improper services for your workload. So on the one hand, you could say that this is too many configurations. But on the other hand, for professionals, this may not be enough because if you really know how to optimize your workload, you may be looking for something that's very specific to your workload and it's not currently offered in the cloud. So let's take an example. So we have a workload that asks for four CPUs and eight gigabytes of memory and one gigabyte of disk space for whatever reason. And we also need a GPU. Let's say we want to use, we want to do some kind of machine learning training. So the clothes we can find in cloud are two machines. So one is uh, quite beefy with 16 cores and a lot of memory, a lot of disk, and it has a GPU. But this is too much too much of a waste for us. So for that GPU, we pay quite a lot of for CPU and memory. On the other hand, we have another machine that has perfect allocation for CPU memory and disk but it doesn't have a GPU, right? So this is also something that doesn't work for us. So in some sense, we would like to avoid these bundles and the situation becomes even worse when, when our requirements change. So if the workload changes suddenly and suddenly we need 32 cores instead of, instead of four, we have a problem, we have to change the machine and this is quite a lot of work again on the users to, to automatically do that. So, uh, what we would like and what's our goal uh, for the cloud of the future, we would like to uh, automatically provide sufficient amount of resources for every application and every application load. So if the load changes, we would like to track that automatically. And on the other hand, we don't want to charge users for what they don't use, only for resources they utilize with their application. To achieve this goal, what we need to change in the current cloud infrastructure is to better communicate between cloud users and cloud providers. We want to actually communicate our performance goals to the cloud provider and enable cloud provider to optimize everything and automate everything for us. So how does this look like? So we, we've seen this loop where we pick a configuration, evaluate, pick our configuration, deploy, pick our configuration, and then um, do that until we find optimal configuration. Well, we could, we could split the work, right? So we as users could just communicate our goals to the cloud, and then cloud does the rest. Cloud does the, the, the other two steps, and hopefully we can automate this. And, and this is to, to a large extent already implemented uh, in current cloud offerings. So if you say what's your um, CPU requirement or like what was the target CPU utilization for your application, uh, the cloud can actually scale your, your workload relatively efficiently. Um, again, depends on, on the concrete work that you're using, but there are quite some effort to, to achieve this. The problem with this loop is that these performance goals are quite diverse. So some applications care about 95% request latency or average throughput, average execution time, uh, amount of failures, uh, or anything, any, any combination of those, which becomes very difficult for cloud, cloud providers to understand and build the interface that can consume all these goals together. So what we propose is to simplify the interface and actually communicate something that we call happiness index to the cloud. So the application will just provide happiness, basically, am I happy or not happy with the current configuration? And the cloud should do the rest. And as you, as you may guess at this point, right, so we, we need quite sophisticated machine learning techniques to, to transform a single value, which is happiness, into configuration for a particular application. This is a, this is a quite a challenging problem to solve. So to define happiness in, um, uh, more formally, happiness is a value between zero and one, where one means happy and zero not that happy. 
Um, and it, rep it represents happiness with two things, performance and the cost. We want to say how, um, how much we are happy with, with the current performance we are seeing from a particular application. But again, not, so to avoid overpaying, we, we want to also include the cost in that, you know, in that interface and express uh, how much we care about cost for a particular application. Also, what we have to define is what something we call happiness domain. So basically, you want to describe a particular set of applications or systems that are tied to the happiness you're providing. That can be only a single virtual machine or a bunch of, uh, bunch of virtual machines and cloud databases or, or any combination of like any cloud service, like serverless functions, cloud managed databases, uh, caches, and, and so on. So you just want to define a domain and then provide, continues to provide happiness for that domain and hopefully cloud can optimize configuration for, for your particular domain. Here's an example of, um, of such a happiness function. So uh, this is a very, a very simple function to define. So you have your workload, you measure execution time. If you complete in 20 seconds, you're very happy with that. Uh, if you complete in 60 seconds, you're okay. And if you complete your workload with more than 60%, uh, 60 seconds, you're not, not happy with, uh, with the configuration, with the execution. Now, this simple function actually allows the cloud to play with the configurations and then find the optimal one for us, but also for themselves. Note that since we allow our workload to finish within 10 seconds and 50 seconds, this gives room to the cloud to play with our workload with other workloads and then optimize utilization on their side and hopefully reduce the cost for everyone in the cloud. Now, with the happiness, this loop looks slightly, slightly different. So we communicate happiness index, we report happiness index to, to the cloud, but there is another thing that cloud providers may use to, to optimize the configuration, which is basically resource utilization of a particular application. So we should track, again, CPU utilization, network communication, and things like that, and combine all those things with the happiness index to find the best possible configuration for the cloud. Some questions that you may, um, you may have about this, this interface, is a happiness function known to the provider? So should we write it as a piece of code and then hand it into to the provider to evaluate it? Well, this would be very tricky because the cloud providers don't understand these functions and don't know how to, have, how to evaluate them. Some of them depend on, let's say, DNS. Some of them depend on, uh, on GPU, on uh, request latency, on many things that only users can, can, can measure. Should we go with push or pull model? Basically, uh, should users communicate this value to the cloud, or cloud should ask users about their happiness? Ideally, we would like to have happiness information at each moment in time because Cloud providers optimize these things automatically, and whenever they need it, they would like to have happiness value. But this is not possible because for some workloads, happiness is available only at certain moment in time. So this is why we have to go with push value, with push model, where users communicate their happiness to the cloud. If you depend on execution time, for example, you have to report, you can report execution time only after your workload has finished. Otherwise, you don't have that information. What about the cost? Should we include the cost in, um, as a single value in the happiness, or we should, uh, we should keep it separate? So there, these two options have, um, have certain consequences. If we report happiness separately, uh, this is good for, uh, for cloud providers. They have more insight into application. This is more hassle for the users. But the cool thing about this is that as we increase resource configuration, we add more CPU, we add more bandwidth from A to B, the happiness ultimately can just improve, right? More if, the, if you remove the cost, more CPU can only make you happier. It cannot deteriorate your performance. There are some exceptions, but uh, generally this is, this is true. However, if you include the cost, the problem is it's cool for the users because they don't have to uh, worry too much about it. They just have a single value. But the problem is that as you increase the, the resource configuration, as you add more resources, 
the happiness may drop, which makes it very difficult to optimize for, uh, for changing workload. So if your workload changes, having the cost as a part of happiness number really makes your life, your life difficult. However, it's not impossible, and we, we show that in the paper if you're interested, uh, but it really complicates the, the search for, for your optimal configuration. Now, the cool thing with this interface is that we remove the need for, for resource bundle, we automate configuration search, we avoid suboptimal configuration because you're always in a configuration that makes you super happy, and potentially we enable dynamic pricing. So what it means is that when uh, utilization of the data center is low, cloud providers may actually give you more resources to make you happy, but when the, when the utilization is very high, we can, they can take back some of those resources and still keep you sufficiently happy but achieve high utilization and meet everyone's goals, which is not currently possible because cloud providers don't actually understand what your applications care about. So one just disclaimer here that this model only works if we decouple costs from the, from the happiness uh, but more detail on that you can find in the paper. Now, there are some challenges that we, that we have to solve here. First, defining the happiness function may not be that easy for, for many users. They have to find a function that um, uh, includes every single aspect of their application, which may be quite a lot of work for, uh, for the users. But I would argue that this is actually necessary because in order to develop something and deploy it efficiently, you must really understand every single aspect of your application and it's good to validate it formally by defining a happiness, happiness function. Another problem is scalability and convergence time. So we want to converge fast and, and in, our, in our experiments we show that 10 to 30 iterations are sufficient for relatively simple applications to find the optimal configuration. We also worry about workload stability. For example, in, in, in our experiments, here we see uh, a CDF graph um, of happiness value for a single configuration. Uh, so even if the configuration remains the same, the happiness is not always constant. As we see, there is a little variance uh, on happiness around 60% in this particular experiment. This is fine, we can, we can deal with it, but what happens when the, when the changes in happiness are quite significant and then cloud providers cannot actually understand what's going on with the happiness function? So we need a, a failure over mechanism and sort of stop the optimization and hand it over to the user uh, because it's simply in some cases impossible to, to do this automatically. And finally, we, want, we have to deal with changes of resource allocation. For example, what happens to the application if you add more bandwidth? Usually this is not an issue, you just communicate faster. But if you add a new CPU, you potentially need to change your application and leverage that new CPU by adding more threads or uh, pinning your threads to new CPU and things like that, which may be application dependent and very difficult to do automatically. To, to show a simple example of how, how this all works on, uh, uh, in practice, uh, we use serverless computing. And serverless computing is cool because it has only a single dimension that we optimize. Uh, it's called memory, and memory also allocates the, uh, the CPU uh, time as well. And we have a simple workload. So, so we upload the image of a duck, we run a TensorFlow model within a serverless function, and we, speak, we, we, we classify this image and we say it's a duck. So now we measure the execution time and the cost of a bunch of these, these um, configurations that we can have. And because this is only a single dimension, it's very simple to see. So red line is the cost, uh, is the execution time, orange line is the cost, uh, and it's very simple to see where the optimal configuration is. When the costs start increasing, and then the execution time doesn't change, this is the optimal configuration, it's very easy to detect it with, with almost any model you, uh, you want to deploy. But the situation becomes a bit more difficult uh, when we have a complex pipeline. So now instead of a single function, we have two functions that work together. 
So let's say we upload a video, one function deals with some kind of video transformation, which is usually heavy, and another one deals with metadata, which is very like which is usually very lightweight. So in this scenario, we can use the, the same happiness function we had before. We care about the execution time, and as long as execution time is under 20 seconds, uh, we care about the cost. Otherwise, we are we are not very happy with the with the execution. Here I just shared the um, uh, the main results. So for this, we use safe bias and optimization. Again, more details in the paper. The optimization cost for this for this pipeline was only one cent. Uh, so this is how much cost we we incur. And then we managed to to reduce the cost of the running the pipeline by finding the optimal configuration by 50% um, after the after our optimization. So this is actually pretty cool because for many workloads the optimization is is very cheap. So if we run our workload at like very wrong configuration, let's say 100% CPU, that's like, let's say the maximum amount of CPU we can allocate, and the answer is 10%. If we do that, this is like a huge gap. If we do this for 400 times, this is one cent. So for us, it was uh, much less than that, but like even if you're very wrong for a very long period of time, the cost is still not very significant. Now, just to um, wrap up with, uh, with the efforts in the industry, so this is the ultimate goal to communicate what makes us happy or, or unhappy. And there are certain, certain efforts by all major cloud providers to, to go in this direction. For example, what Oracle does uh, is try to provision your cluster automatically for databases and try to optimize the configuration of that database to really maximize your happiness. AWS offers Compute Optimizer, which gives you suggestions based on all these things that we have seen, like resource utilization and so on, what's your what your optimal configuration should be. And a similar thing exists in Google Cloud and many other cloud providers. With this, I'd like to conclude by saying that this interface that expresses user happiness with the configuration enables more user-friendly uh, cloud without resource bundles. It avoids suboptimal resource allocation and brings cloud closer to, to the ultimate model that we all want, pay for what you use, or in the future, I hope it will be paying only for what makes you happy. With that, I'd like to thank you all for, for your attention, and I'm happy to play, take questions if, if there are any. Thank you, Voiso, for this uh, for the insight into the happiness index and cloud. Now, the, my question would be regarding the loss of some of the data that you get once you transfer to the happiness index. Um, not not loss per se, but sort of when you focus on just the one one point rather than some of the others. I do apologize for this. When you focus on one point rather than some of the others, is this something that a company would look like uh, would look at and say maybe it's better to use this other approach rather than the happiness index? So, I would say what prevents companies for uh, from going uh, like full speed in this direction um, is the worry that they can basically screw up your configuration uh, if they do something wrong with optimization. And as you know, with all machine learning models, it's very difficult to, to provide any kind of guarantees. So this is why major providers go with recommendations. So you need to approve the final configuration for their application because for, for mission critical applications, it may be very tricky to change a configuration and then you suddenly kill something and then you have, you have a huge issue. So this is a potential loss. Uh, if that's what you mean, and this is a real problem, but to, to make the system work, we need a slight adjustment from the user side as well. So you need to be aware that these changes are possible in your application and design it in such a way. I would argue this is not a huge change, but still you need to develop this in mind uh, in order to have uh, a functioning system. Okay, uh, thank you for that um, explanation. And let's say some of the, when a company 
goes uh, does the change and does start using the happiness index what are some of the let's say working problems that you foresee could happen at the very beginning uh, when so let's say the change happened and then they start utilizing it but what are some of the issues that may still remain more from the culture of the company rather than the system itself so uh, i spoke to to major cloud providers about this and i was lucky to uh, to get a chance to talk to them, and, and many of them liked the approach and had similar ideas. But their, like, what they told me from from practical perspective is that users first don't know what they want, and they don't want to penalize them for that. Like defining this function is very challenging, and they don't want to they don't want to force users to to go in this direction. This is the first thing. And the second thing is that users like stability. So, so the, 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 the thing I mentioned, where you assign more resources to someone, uh, makes them think that actually they should get these resources all the time, not just when it's a position low, but they just, you just give them higher expectations for no reason. And this is something they, they're worried about from a practical perspective. It has nothing to do with optimization, I think, but just the, the mindset of users. Once they see better configuration for lower cost, they always want that. OK, understood. Well, that's it with the questions. And uh, thank you once again, Voisa, for this, uh, for this insight and uh, this great topic. And hopefully, you inspired some of the people to look, look into it more. Uh, on behalf Thank of you very much. It was a pleasure. Yeah, I hope you had fun presenting as well. And once again, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, right. Thank you. Thank you.